By 2032, ACT will empower 20.2 million more learners to exit high school ready for post-secondary and work opportunities. We will concentrate our work around five strategic pillars. Build, inform, connect, mobilize, and partner. We are collaborating with key stakeholders to bring this bold new vision to life. We've got our work cut out for us, and with your support moving forward, we will make it happen. All right, well, welcome to uh, our session, encouraging uh, learning at any age and the availability of it. Um, I know people are going to join us in progress, so but let's go ahead and get started, and uh, people will uh, join our, our, our program already in session. Um, our session today is uh, uh, people who are continuing their education and also beginning their education uh, in some innovative programs that are uh, knocking down some barriers uh, to keep people from entering uh, uh, post-secondary education. Um, if you navigated to us by mistake, uh, meant to go to some other session, um, uh, you're welcome, more than welcome to stay with us. As I have said earlier in other sessions, it's not like getting on the wrong plane uh, at the airport. Uh, we're not gonna take you to uh, Peoria, uh, Peoria against your will, um, but we have some exciting uh, panelists here with some background, and I think this discussion will be pretty good. Um, before we get started, I wanna take a minute to thank our sponsors. Um, ITC Midwest is the presenting sponsor of IO Ideas. And for people who are not familiar with uh, ITC Midwest, it's a Cedar Rapids company. Um, and they are one of the major players in the Midwestern power grid. Um, and uh, if anybody lived through the trade show, uh, you realize how important they were um, and the extra effort they went through to get our power back and uh, replace parts of the grid that was destroyed by the natural disaster. Um, and uh, they are the major uh, uh, presenting sponsor for the IO Ideas. Uh, for this higher education track, uh, we one of our, our sponsor is ACT, which is the Iowa City-based uh, uh, test uh, program. And uh, we thank them very much. It's because of our sponsors that we are able to offer this for free. Uh, people around the state can sign up and participate in this, in this for free. Um, and so hats off to our sponsors for doing that. Um, I will introduce our panel here, and it may not be in the order you see them in the screen, but I'll just kind of go down the list. Um, Rob Denson is the president and CEO of the uh, Des Moines Area Community College. Um, I should note that he's the first native Iowan president of, of the uh, campus. We also have Amy uh, Lazak, who is the uh, executive director of continuing education at Kirkwood Community College here in Cedar Rapids. And we also have Paul Sapp, who is the director, the fairly new director of um, a program called UNI and uh, DMAC. And um, he can describe that some more. That's one of the innovative programs that's going on to uh, uh, help uh, students uh, continue their education beyond high school. Uh, I should note also that each of them have been um, at their campuses for about 20 years, not necessarily in jobs there now, but for 20 years. So we have a lot of experience here as well. Um, so let me go ahead and get the, the uh, uh, conversation started here. Uh, let me first talk about uh, one of the goals that we've had um, in the state for a while, uh, the future ready goal um, has been um, to have at least 70% of Iowans uh, with um, education and training beyond high school by 2025. So that's 70% of some post-secondary education and training by 2025. And uh, the numbers I checked earlier this week is uh, we're at 61.6% of the people who've got uh, certificates. Uh, if you include people who've had other education besides um, after high school, but may not have gotten a, a certificate or uh, graduated with a degree. We're up to 71.8%. That's a pretty generous uh, way of counting them. Um, but still, we sounds like we have some work to do to hit that 71% goal. Um, 
uh, in the next two years. So that's kind of the overall um, education standard that um, the state has had for several years. Um, I want to start with Amy a little bit uh, to talk about um, what are the what are the motivations or the drivers between uh, why somebody would go back uh, to continue their education. I graduated from high school. Uh, I may have gotten a job as a welder, which is a very in-demand um, career right now. Uh, what might motivate somebody like me to get some additional training? Sure. Um, you know, still some of the, the different types of things in the past that have wanted, uh, enabled people to go back to school, like life transitions, being maybe being layoffs or your kids graduating. Now it's an opportunity for you to uh, try a different passion. Those are certainly still in play for people that are looking to go back to school and maybe get another degree or certification on something that they already have. Um, changes in the economy are things that always spur people on. Uh, and in the past, when the economy's been really tight, people are usually going back to identify different ways that they can uh, reskill or find a different skill. Uh, in today's economy, where the workforce is uh, very tight, and most of our employers are doing a really good job of highlighting the opportunities within their walls of the benefits they have, the good pay, the hours, that individuals that maybe have a very good career as a welder or a very good career in another area are potentially taking a look at other passions and maybe looking at different ideas that they want to do. And uh, the flexibility that education has uh, in, incorporated into their field um, has enabled a lot of folks to be able to do that in addition to continuing the work. So things like apprenticeships or night classes or shorter certificate programs, those are educational paths that in the past weren't able to be uh, used by individuals that needed to reskill or upskill or certify in different ways. So now the flexibility factor has enabled them to take things to the next level and build upon their resume. So if you flash back in time, one of the great motivators for people going to a community college across the nation was the Great Recession when people got laid off from their jobs and uh, uh, were trying to uh, build their skills or maybe enter an entirely different uh, uh, career line. Um, I thought about myself after I got laid off in, uh, in when I lived in Florida. Um, and you're, you're faced with all kinds of jobs of skills you never knew existed before. Uh, and job titles you never knew before. Um, we don't have that great recession going on right now, which is good. Um, so I think the motivations are, like you said, they are, they are uh, the global globalization of, of, of uh, the economy, um, uh, people having a different passion they want to pursue, uh, but also because people want to maybe join management and it requires uh, a, a, a different level of skills, or there may be some... Uh, required training from your employer uh, to get a certificate or something else. Um, the um, That's one reason that people might go back. Um, but we also have um, a different way to get into educa uh, secondary education than you had before. I remember when I went to school, I'm dating myself again, but um, you pretty much had one choice. You went to a college. It was either in town or you had to go somewhere else, physically go somewhere else and uh, take classes and um, uh, you know, rent uh, a, a, a room to stay in or whatever and all those additional expenses. Um, and um, Rob and Paul have been working for quite a while um, on, on a, uh, a pro uh, several programs. Uh, and we see a lot of these around the state where um, um, I, I call them two plus two uh, programs. That probably is too simple, but it's like two years at a community college and then two years at the university. Um, uh, Paul, do you want to talk? You've been in, in, in uh, engaged in this for quite a while, uh, even before you got uh, uh, made the director uh, of the program at UNI. Do you want to talk a little bit about that program and kind of what uh, what is it? Uh, one one question. You know, what is the program? And the second reason is, question is, well, why do we have it? Why do we have programs like that? Yeah, thanks, Craig. Um, the partnership started in 2020 and, and we started it with DMAC. Um, and it's it's meant to target place-bound students. 
Um, I think the community colleges have always done a great job, a, a better job than I would say a lot of the four-year schools in targeting those, those students who, who can't move from their home area and go to Cedar Falls or Iowa City or Ames or, you know, they're, they're place bound maybe by a job or they own a home, they have a family. Um, so we wanted to give them an option, another option for uh, a four-year university. So uh, what students uh, do through the partnership is they start with DMAC, uh, do a two-year degree with DMAC, and then through online and distance courses, they can stay in the central Iowa area and complete a UNI degree in one of 11 areas, um, 11 different majors we offer. Um, this has been successful enough that we've now expanded this partnership to all 15 community colleges across the state. And uh, we're offering majors in high need areas. Um, elementary ed is our biggest uh, online program. Uh, we offer several different pathways within criminology and management and human services. So we're really targeting those adult learners. Um, the other thing we offer within the program are several BAS programs, Bachelors of Applied Science, that pair well with community colleges, associates of applied science. So oftentimes an associate of applied science is a technical degree. It may not transfer as well to a four-year school, um, but it will transfer well into our BAS programs. We'll essentially take their AAS degree as a package that we just say completes two of their four years and then we layer that with some additional management and business courses. And now they have a bachelor's of applied science. And that may be for the student who, who you know, they got that AAS degree in, in something like welding or wind turbine and, and probably got a, a really good job right out of college. But now they may be looking to move up in management. And that management position may just require a bachelor's degree. So we're getting a lot of returners, folks who've got their AAS five, 10 years ago, and now they may be looking to move up in that corporate structure and just need that bachelor's degree. You mentioned uh, place-bound students. And uh, let me expand on that a little bit. Uh, and maybe uh, Rob could uh, weigh in here as well. Um, place-bound is... Uh, there's more to it, I think, than the, than I think a lot of people realize. It's it's not only um, living somewhere, but there are other factors as well, uh, such as families and uh, transportation. And um, I, I know that um, um, that has come into play in in in, ter in terms of what kind of students you uh, uh, gear these programs to. Rob, do you want to talk about that a little bit more about sure. what it means to be place bound and and why this program might be something that somebody might want to look at if they, if they do find themselves place bound? Well, you and I and DMAC, uh, that project started in downtown Des Moines. Our urban campus uh, is the first majority students of color college or university campus in the, in the state of Iowa. And uh, in a, a lot of the students that we service, I mean, most of them are working some one or two jobs. Uh, but also they're relatively high percentage of low income individuals there. And they just really, they, because of life and other things, they don't have the ability, as Paul said, to move to Cedar Falls or even go to Ames, just only 35 miles north. And transportation is an issue. Uh, so we try to break down all those barriers. And, and on the transportation side, uh, there's DART, which is the, the bus service in central Iowa and Des Moines. You know, we, we buy universal access so any student of DMAC can ride the bus anytime, anywhere for free. Uh, so it, it, we try to you know, see what the barriers are and knock them down. And just like, uh, as Paul said, they, most of these individuals would not get a four-year degree if it wasn't for the fact that it was here. And they could get to it. And it's, it's relatively easy for them to get, for example, to our urban campus. To go back to one thing that Amy talked about uh you know, historically, the data has been very clear that the higher the level of educational attainment you have, the more lifetimes earning, lifetime earnings you'll, that you'll receive. Uh, an associate degree is better than high school and then, then, a, then a bachelor's, master's and on up the line. 
uh, it improves your ability to get better jobs at, at higher income. So I think that's something we, we continue to push and we believe is still gonna be true. In central Iowa, we've got 96,000 adults who have some college, but no degree. Uh, so you know, for whatever reason, they did get started, but then they didn't complete. So we're reaching out to them uh, and say, okay, you know, you've got, you've made, you made your start. Hopefully you don't have a lot of debt, but come back, get, get your two-year degree and then go on to UNI uh, because it's right here uh, to finish up. Uh, and we talk about the ease of getting it. I tell you, Iowa companies are pretty doggone good uh, in recruiting and keeping individuals. Many of them have tuition reimbursement. So very likely a lot of people are working for a company that would pay or reimburse the cost of college if they would, if the individual would just take the time, identify a program and get into it. So, and, and as I uh, have told others, you're leaving money on the table. I mean, you're making a good salary, hopefully, but the, the tuition reimbursement is there waiting for you. And if you would take advantage of it and spend a couple of years picking a, either improving your current uh, skill set or even getting into a new area. Uh, there are so many good jobs right now uh, that, that are here waiting and the companies are looking for skilled talent that you know there really has never been a better time. Uh, also, the governor has a last dollar scholarships. So in many different areas, the state will pay your tuition at a community college before you take out any loans. And that's in over 60 different high demand careers. Uh, but in the, now going back to your original question, uh, DMAC has 13 sites throughout central Iowa. Most community colleges have multiple sites. We know that if we're gonna help people move ahead, we've gotta be within a reasonable driving distance of, of where they live. Uh, so with the, the state support and other, you know, we have, we have put our locations throughout our entire 22 county area in central Iowa. Uh, in fact, we just opened our 13th center uh, in Templeton, Iowa, uh, with a grant we received from the state in order to help high school students there get more career and technical training. So uh, the 15 community colleges in Iowa uh, not only work well together, but, but we look at the businesses that need to hire students and we design programs specifically to help them get the workforce they need. Yeah, yeah I, I do wanna talk about that. I, I do wanna talk about uh, uh, the you know cost of higher education because that is a stumbling block to a lot of people as the same thing as, as place bound. So I do wanna come back to that. Um, but um, let me talk a little bit first about um, the, um, Amy, you had said earlier in a conversation we had about uh, uh, people kind of coming in, uh, having the off ramp and coming back in and back and forth. Do you wanna talk about that a little bit more about how, um, for some people, the uh, the path to ed extra education is not a continuous line. It's a on and off. Um, and uh, what? How does that play out at the at Kirkwood? I mean, is that uh, I don't know how big of a percentage that is of your uh, of your student body, but tell us how that works. If somebody makes a commitment that yes, I'm going to take some classes, but uh, I'm going to go do other things and then come back later. Um, is that, is that a, something you're seeing a lot more of, or has it always been percolating in the background? I just wonder how, how common that is. Yeah, I, I would say the last, last year to five years, it's really increased uh, dramatically to have a lot of folks that, you know, life happens. It used to be that there was a very linear way of uh, progressing after high school. You went in high school, you either went into work or you went into college and then you found a job and there you go. Um, but there's so many more variables in people's lives anymore that sometimes that path just isn't as straight and they, they need to find opportunities to figure out how to increase their educational level throughout their entire lifetime. Um, and as Rob mentioned, it's really important for those individuals to figure out ways to do that because uh, as you mentioned earlier, we all have been in this uh, realm for 20 plus years, we've seen the economy go up and down. Uh, we, were, we were around when the dot-com bubble burst. And my first job at Kirkwood was working with individuals who were laid off from work. And I'll, I'll never forget some of those individuals that came into my office with high school diplomas making six figures, but their, their plant just closed. 
and trying to find them a job that made something even close to what they were making was almost impossible until they figured out a way to maneuver and, and upgrade their skills, but they still had bills to pay at that point. They were used to living at that certain level of income. And we're seeing that now with individuals um, on the opposite end is that their jobs are aplenty. And so they're very comfortable going into a job and working and not worrying about upgrading their skills over time. And so I think Rob's point is a very important one of the message that needs to come across is that you need to continue to have these on and off ramps of education because there might be an oper- there might be a time where you find yourself unemployed or the job market is a lot tighter than it is now. And if um, you rest on your laurels of what you've done and your pay keeps increasing over the years, um, that would be very difficult. So at Kirkwood, we have a lot of continuing education classes with shorter term certificate programs that people can take for six weeks and then go work. And then they can come back and they can take that certificate program and articulate it over to a credit program and get their degree later on. So there's lots of different ways that people can continue to move their education. And I think that's the future of education is that flexibility, being able to keep the needs of our students where they are. Yeah, and we're also seeing a lot of movement away from seat time. Uh, Mm -hmm. We just got a grant uh, with Indian Hills and Hawkeye to develop more uh, competency-based education, where if if you want to be a welder or a truck driver, uh, you don't have to sit through 16 weeks of classes if you can do it in four weeks where you learn the skill. So we we provide additional lab time and support so individuals can move through their degree or program uh, or certificate at, you know, at their own pace. And I think that's, you're going to see more and more of that uh, as time goes on. I, I, I want to talk about that because I think that's very interesting. That kind of fits in the category of, I think all community colleges do this, where you you have some, you, you reach out to businesses and they are involved in the in the programs. Um, uh, Rob or Amy, either one of you or maybe both, do you, you want to talk about that a little bit in terms of, um, um how you tailor your, your programs to what what the what was actually needed? Well, every every program at a, at a community college, and this is because of our accreditation requires it. Uh, every program has an advisory committee of the companies that hire students out of that program. Uh, a lot of stu- companies want to be on our advisory committees to get the first uh, access to these students coming through. Uh, but they tell us what to teach, the, the competencies. They they forecast for us what's coming down the road in four or five years, what we should prepare for. They keep us up to speed on the the, the equipment that we need to have and technology. Uh, and, and that's one of the reasons that our students do so well when they leave us. Uh, they are They are technologically ready to go to work because they've been taught to the specs of the companies that are on our advisory committees. Uh, and then an additional component, you know, we've learned for, you know, 50 years that companies expect our students to have the technological skills, but it's those employability soft skills that are also important. So we spend a lot of time working with our students on on timeliness, communication, working in teams, uh, working period, working hard, uh, so that when they leave, not only can they do the welding or whatever it may be, uh, but they're going to move up because they know how to work in teams and work in groups and they're productive. Uh, so it, it's a two prong approach, technology and those, those employability skills. If someone's going to be a success. Yeah, I would just add too that on the non-credit side of the college is we have to have our fingers on the pulse of what employers are wanting all the time. And sometimes we have to be able to turn on a dime to provide that for them. So we have a lot of focus groups that a lot of times out of those focus groups come short-term certificate programs that we're able to create within a very relatively short amount of time. Um, And employer involvement is critical for us to make sure that we're delivering what those employers are wanting. Absolutely. Now, now for uh, education for dummies like me, um, credit aside and not credit aside, when we're talking about not non-credit side, what are we talking about? That's uh, programs that people uh, go to ta- to get certificates rather than a, than a degree, or what, what's the, what's the difference between credit and non-credit? Well, yeah, it's usually a, a non-credit program is is a shorter program, uh, and it's it deals more with this competency development. 
uh, and, and the same program can be a credit program in one college and a non-credit in others. I know our CDL truck driving program is non-credit uh, and other colleges have that as a credit program. It's just how we like to offer it. Uh, and, and again, the, since it's competency-based, uh, we move students through. Uh, but in the long run, it's good to link those certificates uh, together into some kind of a, a diploma. And Amy mentioned it earlier, you take a non-credit course today, uh, you come back next week and you wanna do more, uh, we can convert that non-credit to credit so that you're not, we're not going to make you repeat something you already know, and uh, we've got we've got to be agile, uh, and but that's that's just the way the way things are. When I uh, let's let's talk about costs in, in, for a minute here because we we touched on this. I just want to talk about it some more because it, it's very confusing for a lot of people. Um, the uh, let's say that I have a career already, and I want to continue my education. Uh, for, you know, I want to get a different job or I want to elevate the job I have now or learn some additional skills that qualify me for something else. Um, how do all these things fit together? I hear about the last dollar scholarship. I, you know, uh, uh, about Pell Grants. I mean, I, 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 it's enough to make the head spin. Um, so if I'm, if I'm a student or, you know, potential student, uh, and I want to continue my education. I've already graduated from, from high school and maybe some college. Um, how do I get started? Do I just call the colleges and say, help? Uh, <laughs> do I fill out a FAPSA application? What, what do I do? Well, I, I think, you know, whether it's a, a community college or a university, uh, we, we've all got uh, advisors and counselors that are readily available that can sit down with anyone and, and, you know, if, if you know you want to go into the healthcare area, for example, we've got, we put all our programs and pathways. Now, you may not know what in healthcare you want to do. So you'd come to, to DMAC, for example, you'd enter into our health pathway, and then you'll start taking classes and decide then whether you want to be a radiology tech or a registered nurse uh, to move forward. And, and, and we've got, most of us have uh, courses uh, usually that you take at your, at early in your career that help you do some of the interest inventories, et cetera, to decide, number one, what, where you want to go and what you want to do. And then number two, we find the money. Uh, all colleges, we've got scholarship funds that can provide some support. The federal Pell dollars, you, I mean, taking the FAFSA is always a good idea because so many uh, scholarships, et cetera, including last dollar scholarship, you've got to have that uh, FAFSA base so the granting agency understands what your financial situation is and how much need you might have or need. Uh, but yeah, and then we lead you through the process. Yesterday, I was in uh, Dallas Center Grimes uh, working with a, a, a high school counselor and three students that wanted to come to DMACC and this counselor just did an amazing job of, of it's, it's like a puzzle because every student's different. They've had different background courses, background experiences, but our, our advisors and counselors are good at saying, okay, based on what you've got, here are the next three steps you need. And then you can get into nursing school or whatever, whatever it might be. But yeah, uh, the easiest thing to do, uh, you know, I would never advise somebody to go to a website and start reading. Uh, you will get lost quickly and probably decide to go back to whatever you were doing before. But just sit down with one of the professionals. And, it, and again, it could be at, a, at UNI, any of the universities, private colleges, or any of the community colleges. And, and we will help walk you through it and then help you find the dollars that might be available. And a credit to the Iowa legislature, uh, and this has been historically true, they have provided a, a, a good number of funding I call them buckets, uh, where, where they recognize a particular need, they make the money available, and then the colleges can access that funding to help students who might be in that particular high demand area. Uh, I was pretty progressive, you know, in, in, in helping individuals move forward, uh, because we, we've always had a, a high priority for education. Craig, I think yeah. you brought up a yeah. good point, because um, a lot of students don't know where to start. They, they don't know what the first step is in getting financial aid. And I think there's a, a more of a focus with a lot of these students nowadays on 
not graduating with a lot of debt. Um, they hear about, you know, some of the previous generations and, and the debt they accrued. And a lot of the students I'm talking to don't want to accrue that kind of debt. Uh, with the program I've been involved in, we offer a future ready scholarship for students in these programs that helps bring their university uh, costs down to a community college price tag. So we've really, we felt like affordability was an important factor in offering this because a lot of these, again, are non-traditional students. They may be funding their own child, their own traditional age child at a university and have other, you know, costs. And so we've really worked hard to make affordability a, a, an important factor. Well, and we well, see this year, we, uh, we, we know of students that have decided not to even start uh, because they're scared of debt. And number and, and historically, many students come to us undecided. And, and now we're hearing from parents that are telling their children, look, if you don't know what you want to do, you work. We're not going to pay you to go to college and maybe <laughs> take on debt when you don't even know what you want to do, uh, which that's kind of a new phenomenon that, that we're noticing this year. One of the messages I'm, I'm hearing a lot is um, uh, whether somebody is place bound for some reason um, or they're worried about cost. Um, the overwhelming message I'm hearing from, from all of you is don't give up, up hope that um, uh, if you want to pursue uh, a, a post-secondary education in some way, shape or form, um, those things um, are, are barriers that could be overcome. I think that's what I'm hearing everybody say in one way or the other. Well, and do not ignore the fact that most of, your, of our employers are going to provide tuition reimbursement. Right. I mean, that, that, that is the most commonly uh, skipped step where, where individuals think they don't have the time. Yes, they're working hard and time is, 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 a, is a limited commodity. Uh, but when the funding is there, it's worth it for you to spend a year or so working even a little bit harder but having something at the other end where you really have little or no debt. Yeah, I, I would add too that one of the things for the parents that are out there, one of the things that I think is overlooked is um, when your kids are in high school, having them pursue dual credit opportunities where they're in high school and taking community college credit. My son just graduated uh, this last May and that was one of the best things he did was to take Kirkwood classes while he was in high school because once he went to college, he wasn't quite sure what direction he was going to go. And because of the dual credit that he provided, it took a year off of his college um, because he switched majors in the middle of the year or in the middle of his college. And that would have been additional debt that he would have taken on. So um, when we talk about lifelong learning, it really is the spectrum all the way from middle high school as, and as you go through your career. And, and actually so, so many of those programs have actually now reach down into high school as well with apprenticeships and uh, uh, you know, like you say, you know, dual enrollment um, um, is it, it, kind of helping people to figure out what they're gonna do for their career path. Um, if they were like me, I thought I was gonna go into something entirely different and discover journalism by mistake, more or less. Um, I wish I would have known about that earlier. <laughs> um, there's other things I, uh, you, you guys have mentioned before about uh, Steps that uh, are taken to try to reduce the 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 expenses that people may 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 face, like um, um, credit for learning that's already been done uh, or already accomplished. Um, Rob, I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit in terms of uh, steps that are taken to uh, uh, help reduce the cost uh, to give credit for. Things that you know, you know we already know, yep. um, or other um, things along that line, uh, like you mentioned, uh, uh, employee uh, reimbursement programs is one of them. But I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about some of the uh, steps that are being taken to reduce the overall costs, and so you like to say you don't have to repeat uh, something you already know. Yeah, when you when you walk into, and this is true for all the community colleges and most universities, when you walk in we're going to ask you about your prior experiences and knowledge. Uh, yes, many individuals that come to us have some college, no degree, so they just want to get back on track. Uh, but we go through that and we call it credit for prior learning. Uh, so we evaluate jobs you've had, et cetera. 
uh, and say, okay, you know, if you've been a welder, that may uh, substitute for the first three welding courses. If you want to become a, a, a licensed certified welder, uh, you've already got that done. So we'll start you in the fourth term instead of in the first term. Uh, and, and again, it's a money issue for you, but it also works for us because over the course of time, we generally have slots open up in uh, various programs. Uh, I will tell you that many of our programs have a very low completion rate. Uh, our auto tech program is about 50% completion. And that's because when, they, when a student gets through the first year, they've got enough skills that they are being actively recruited by every auto dealer in central Iowa who says, look, you don't need a two year degree. I need you right now as an auto tech. And, and, and you've learned enough in the first year that you can do that. Uh, and we only hope those students come back uh, over time to finish. But everybody's happy. I mean, we're probably not as happy because we didn't get that degree completion. But the company is very happy and the students making a good living. Uh, and again, so we're, we're, we're meeting those needs as it goes forward. But, you know, we're like any other business. I mean, we have got to adjust to the needs and demands of our clients. So we, we cannot afford to make them do something that's just jumping through hoops because if DMAC doesn't take care of them, they're going to go to Kirkwood. And, and, and we don't want that to happen. <laughs> and, 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 and vice versa. You know, it, it's, it's, it's taking care of your customers. And, and, just, and looking at transfers, uh, I tell you, the universities in Iowa, public or private, are unbelievably cooperative in, in tr accepting our transfer students when they finish a degree or even if they transfer before they get their degree. Uh, because again, the universities need enrollment just like we need enrollment. You know, they recognize uh, also the skills that individuals bring to the table. And and talking about credit for prior learning, we we became very good at this dealing with returning veterans. Uh, individuals coming out of the military have some excellent skills, and it makes no sense to make somebody go through things they already know. Uh, so we've become very good at understanding and translating credit for prior learning into credits leading toward a degree. The, um, you, you were talking about, um, um, earlier we were talking about uh, working with uh, businesses, you know, because um, anybody who's been paying attention at all knows that we have workforce shortages in Iowa. We have more jobs that we can fill and uh, companies are looking to uh, fill jobs they, they have or expand. Um, and, um, you know, there are not enough uh, people moving here to do that. I don't know that it ever will be. Um, and um, a lot of us uh, falling into train our own. Um, and I know, uh, Rob, you mentioned earlier in a conversation about, um, uh, uh, I can't remember the name of it, Acu... Acumol. Yeah, Acumol. Yeah. Thank you. Um, do you want to talk about that, that experience? Because I think that's really illustrative of this uh uh, working with uh, companies to fill their their needs. So Acumold is an Ankeny-based company. It's a global provider of very high specification injection molding equipment. They make a lot of parts for hearing aids, et cetera. They'll take a couple hundred thousand dollar, a couple hundred thousand pieces uh, of product and you can put it in a pill bottle. I mean, it's unbelievable high tolerances. They sell globally. Uh, they've expanded oh, six or seven times in the 20 years I've been here. But 16 years ago, they could not find tool and die workers. They did not have enough individuals to build and, and handle the equipment that they've got. Uh, DMAC at that time had a tool and die program that we probably should have closed. Uh, we, we'd hold an information session for families and kids, et cetera. And, and even if we provided food, nobody showed up. Uh, so Acumold held one session, 40 people showed up. Uh, they offered them a deal. You know, you work at Acumol 20 hours a week, you go to DMAC 20 hours a week and tool and die. Our program's been full ever since, and 75% of the tool makers out at Acumol came through our program. And again, it reduces debt, but even more important, it gives individuals relevant experience in the career area that they're, that they're aiming toward. Uh, and in this case, Acumol not only paid them a good salary, Acumold uh, uh, pays for their technical courses at DMAC. 
So they, they and they've had a very high retention rate because when students leave or graduate from DMAC, uh, over ninety percent stay at Acumold and and do very well. Now Acumold now is looking at in high schools. Uh, they're on their second cohort of high school juniors and seniors from uh, Bondurant, Farrar, uh, Ankeny Schools, and Waukee. And these kids come, they'll work uh, 10, 15, 20 hours a week at Acumo, go to high school, uh, but they're learning great skills uh, at Acumo. And at the end of the year, we give them a certificate based upon the skills they've actually learned. But it's, it's that kind of uh, partnership uh, that that we've been able to develop with a lot of companies throughout Central Iowa, uh, and I know a lot of them are getting involved in registered apprenticeships. There is a uh, non-registered apprenticeship work-based learning opportunity. Uh, we call it Iowa Learns, uh, also also authorized by the Department of Labor uh, for companies that really don't want to get involved in registered apprenticeships. But we don't care how they do it. We just want to give give individuals uh, opportunities, and uh, you know, seventy percent or more of of Iowa high school juniors and seniors are working somewhere while they're in high school. So we want to get them into good jobs with good futures, uh, and and then help them have the skills so they can move on. That's interesting. You know, when I went to high school, I, you know, you had uh, jobs at uh, you know, high V bagging groceries or something like that, and uh, you knew you were going to leave at the end of high school, but now it's, uh, there's so, so many programs that are actually potentially careers for, yeah. for people uh, to learn while they're still in high school. Uh, that's really interesting. Well, um, and, and hy is not a bad employer. I mean, they, uh, no. they, they uh, we've got a number of our graduates that have gone to work for hy and risen up through the ranks and are doing very, very well. I should have said uh, detasseling corn. I don't know if that's really a thing anymore. <laughs> 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 um, one of the uh, uh, jobs of, uh, of our many uh, job shortages has been accounting. And I know that, uh, Paul, you mentioned that uh, 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 you and I had a hybrid accounting program. I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit, about uh, why that is and who it's meant to address. Yeah, this ties into what you're just talking about in, in yeah. terms of a, a shortage of we had um, accounting firms reaching out to our accounting department at UNI, because we're we're pretty well known for that major, begging for students. Um, they just, you know, here in the Des Moines area, there's a lot of a big accounting firms. They just couldn't find enough people. So uh, our newest program with this partnership is our hybrid accounting program, where students complete uh, either their AA business transfer or DMAX uh, AAS accounting specialist, either one. And then they come into our hybrid accounting program where they take some online courses. But this one also does have some face-to-face -face coursework uh, that's offered here at DMAC Urban. Um, so uh, they the, the current courses are Wednesday evenings. It, it you know accommodates for those working adults. So the class doesn't start till 6 p.m. Um, it's Wednesday evenings, and they they take like six or seven upper level courses face to face, but here in the Des Moines area. So uh, it's meant to um, you know again those place bound students or those students who maybe did an AAS in accounting and now are looking to you know maybe complete that BA degree. So uh, and this was all because industry telling us they needed more accountants. They just couldn't find them. We have uh, in our, we're doing our first cohort right now and we have 13 students in the program. And with the future ready scholarships, I mentioned earlier, plus some industry scholarships, some of these accounting firms gave money. Every single student has some form of really good scholarship. You know, um, Paul, you mentioned something earlier I thought was very interesting. You talked about hybrid programs and, and uh, online learning. Um, you were talking about the uh, the pandemic having a lot of effects on people and uh, you know rethinking what's important to them, but also maybe one of the unintended uh, consequences of that was that uh, so many places went to online learning or online you know uh, remote working that uh, some people you know couldn't stand this. Uh, yet other people uh, thrived. 
And so um, has your experience been that um, some of the students who enroll in these uh, hybrid programs are there maybe of the latter, they are tend, tend to be reassured by the fact that, hey, I, I can work online after all? Yeah, and, and backing up to the first point you made, yeah. um, you know, why students are, are coming back, there's a myriad of reasons. They want to move up, they want to change careers. But again, I think the pandemic gave us all opportunities to reflect on what's important to us and 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 professional goals and, and those things. And so I've had more than a dozen students reference the pandemic saying, you know, they they just realized they weren't happy in what they were doing or or so that's that's been part of my conversations, a, a, a fairly significant part of my conversations in that the pandemic uh, had people in a self-reflective mode. It also, as you mentioned, uh, sort of forced a lot of people into online courses, whether good or bad. Uh, it forced them into this format that maybe they weren't familiar or comfortable with before. Some decided that wasn't for them, you know, and they and, and so if, if that's the case, I never try to talk them into one of my, you know, the programs I'm I'm uh, trying to sell. I, I don't. You know, if, if online's not the format you're comfortable with, then by, by all means, you shouldn't do it. But for a lot of others, they're like, you know, actually, I don't mind it. I like it. It's it's pretty convenient. I can go at my own pace. I can do the coursework um, late at night when I'm free, you know, especially these asynchronous programs, which is what we're offering, where they can do it kind of at their own pace. So for a lot of students, it forced them outside that comfort zone and they realized they they were capable of doing online coursework and it's yeah. and it's convenient hey i could add to that you know dmax had a, a pretty robust uh online program for years but you know when when covid hit we went purely online for a significant period of time uh, and any other fall term at dmac we would be towing cars off the grass because they'd fill our parking lots uh, now we've seen that about 20% of our students are staying online. And so our parking lots are only 80% full, uh, which is good because it gives us space. But just like so many things, they learned how to deal with online while they were uh, off on the pandemic. It saves them gas money in a time when gas is more expensive. It saves them time and if they got a family. Uh, we do know though that students, if you ask them to vote, the majority by a pretty healthy margin uh, want to be face to face. And in fact, this fall, our face-to-face -face enrollment is up 11%. Uh, our online enrollment is only up 0.6%. Uh, but but you know, students prefer, and, and true of most community colleges, uh, our, you know, our class size is about 18 to 1, our average class size. So you know, when our faculty are able to work with students in, in that kind of an environment, you, you know, they become supporters and friends and mentors. Uh, so we prefer online in a lot of, or excuse me, face to face in a lot of ways. But online is a great option that uh, many have become very good at. I want to take a minute to talk about this impending enrollment cliff, quote unquote enrollment cliff that uh, people are talking about coming in the next couple of years. Um, when nationwide the uh, number of students graduating high school will go down uh, because of population changes, and. Um, uh, as a result, um, all the uh, community colleges in Iowa 15 and the public universities and the private universities are essentially all going to be competing for more or less the same students. Um, fewer students to go around um, between all these universities. Um, um, we've seen a lot of these, uh, really the explosion of these two plus two programs, three plus three programs, et cetera. Um, uh, a rise in uh, scholarship availabilities. Um, how much of this is um, driven by the needs of the students versus, hey, we have to have a, uh, a competitive advantage. Um, and so we, we're seeing this explosion because this, this cliff is coming our way and uh, we need to have a good marketing thing out there. Or is it some combination of, of the both? Um, where it meets 
uh, you know, meets uh, meets student needs and also as a good uh, marketing uh, pitch as well. Well, I, I think in a lot of ways uh, we've not a, we've not done a good job of communicating what our actual costs are. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, there's tuition discounting. There's there's all kinds of techniques that we use that are very com uh, confusing to the public. Uh, I think an opportunity we have right now in Iowa, 40% uh, of Iowa high school graduates are not going on to college. To me, that's an insultingly high number in a state that values uh, continuing education. So I think th that represents thousands of students statewide who could go to college, but for some reason aren't. Uh, we need to find out why. Uh, and and, and as, we, as the enrollment cliff comes, you know, we can't afford to have individuals who really could benefit from advanced education not take advantage of it. And oftentimes those individuals that, that don't take advantage of it, you know, it, it may be because they're undecided. They don't think they have the money. Uh, they, they don't have a, the family support structure uh, that has any kind of experience in higher ed and just to navigate all of our, our procedures and, and practices. So I think we're going to have to do a better job at all levels and making sure that we get our message out, you know, and just like uh, even in Iowa, it's several private colleges are talking about free, uh, some free college for low income individuals. Uh, you know, again, it's, it's good. That only helps the individual. I mean, that, that, that is very good to, to make it easier and more incent incentive to get them into these programs. Now, the, the community colleges in Iowa, if you're low, if you're low income and you get maximum Pell, that probably pays all the tuition annually of any college of any community colleges in Iowa. So we're already low income uh, or low cost, excuse me. Uh, so we, we just need to do a better job of communicating to those that should be coming to us anyway. Do you, uh, and this is really open to anybody who, who uh, has an opinion on it. Do you think that with this impending uh, uh, enrollment cliff, that we'll see even more innovation than we've seen in the last couple of years of uh, different programs that we never even thought about um, earlier. Um, kind of what do you see coming your way when you talk about strategic planning for your campuses? Um, how are you dealing with this uh, uh, enrollment cliff, and and what what does it mean for for students trying to get a uh, traditional students or continuing education students? Yeah. I, I think whenever there's a disruption that forces your hand for innovation. So yes, I do think the disruption of the enrollment cliff is going to force our hand to be even more innovative. Uh, I think there will be more collaboration amongst the community colleges and the universities within Iowa to help uh, offset some of the impact that it might have. Um, and I think Rob hit on this a couple of times already, but really the employers and the benefits that they have and the flexibility they can give to their employees to continue their education is going to be key. Anybody else have any uh, thoughts about that as well? I would say it's it's probably not the time, you know, for any of us to rest on our laurels or, or do status quo. You know, I know you and I, not, not through continuing ed or, or uh, online, but we as of fall 24 will be offering a nursing program. And I think that's because of, again, critical shortages in the uh, job market. Um, so yeah, I agree with what Amy and Rob have both said and that I think it's time, this is gonna be a time of, of greater innovation and, and schools listening uh, to industry and what their needs are. Yeah, and, and we're like any business, I mean, we're, we're, our our practices are, are going to be disrupted, like like every other business on the planet. So we've got to continue to innovate, and uh, you know the, the challenge is innovating ahead of the challenge. I mean, we but again, just that our data is extremely uh, is is very good and available. So we need to to look at the data that we're getting and say, okay, how do we react to, to whatever the the circumstance might be. The um, one one of the topics that has been going on for years and was going on when I was uh, way back when when I was a student was brain drain, and um, I just wonder if some of these programs might be ways to address the brain drain, um, and I, I just wonder if anybody could talk about that a little bit because 
that's when you know uh, people get an education in Iowa, and then they take it and leave the state of Iowa to pursue their career. Um, and we've you know essentially lost that that uh, investment that Iowa's had, um, and not helping our workforce. When you look at uh, like continuing education, especially, um, I assume most of those people have jobs in Iowa or have their sights on a job in Iowa. Um, have you done any research into figure out, uh, do those people stay in Iowa? Do they leave Iowa? I just wonder what, what your experience there has been. So 95, or excuse me, 97% of, of DMACC students are Iowans. Mm -hmm. Very little recruiting out of state, uh, but we get a, a fair number, but it's relatively small. 95% of our students stay in Iowa after they graduate. And, and a lot of that is because of our connectivity to business. Mm -hmm. I mean, in, in all the time they're in a classroom or in a program here, there are five or six or 10 businesses and good businesses that are talking to them about Iowa. Uh, and in Akim Old's case, you know, the very, they're, they're going to stay because they're number one. They've always been paid very well. They've got a lot of support with great benefits uh, and, it's, and it's high tech. So it's interesting stuff and students realize they're not going to get a better experience anywhere. And we also see a lot of students leave Iowa for a few years. My wife and I are both from Iowa. We spent 25 years in Florida uh, before we came back and thank, you know, we're very glad we did, but uh, you know, it's, you're going to lose some, but I think for the most part, Iowa, we, we're getting better recreation, uh, uh, more support. And I'm excited about immigration. You know, you look how diverse Iowa is becoming. Uh, you go into Perry, Iowa, and the, the, all the Latino shops and restaurants, I mean, it's as much fun as going out overseas somewhere. I mean, it's it's really a great uh, cultural experience right here in Iowa, and we need to encourage more of that, uh, and, we, and our companies need it for the, for the jobs. And, and, and obviously, Iowa is becoming more and more diverse, and we need to take advantage of that talent. Yeah. I, I'm thinking back 30 years ago when I came to Iowa to go to college and uh, I didn't know any of the employers when I graduated, didn't know what any of the employers did in, in the area, didn't even know where to start to, to apply to jobs. Um, luckily, I was able to find something that met my needs. But I, I think Rob's right. The connection of businesses to our students, our student doesn't know what ABC manufacturing does. They're not going to consider working there. And so we have to make sure that our employers are positioned so that they can communicate the things that they do. We do some really exciting things in Iowa. There are there are things in space that are made in Iowa. Um, and if we can communicate that and connect that to our students, that's going to help. Thank you very much for your conversation. And we're almost out of time here today. Uh, so I definitely want to thank our panelists uh, for participating in this. And I know everybody's busy, so I'm, I'm very glad you took some time out of your busy day to uh, meet with us. And uh, hopefully uh, our audience got something out of this and we'll, we'll act on it. Um, let me talk really quickly about the rest of I I ideas here. Um, uh, this is the first day of our uh, 2003, uh, 2023 uh, session, today and tomorrow. Um, if you don't have it on your calendar, you might want to look at the uh, keynote address at 3.30 by Frances Hogan. She is probably uh, best known as being the Facebook uh, whistleblower. Yeah. Uh, and her connection to Iowa, she uh, is from Iowa City, uh, went to high school there in Iowa City. And she's going to be talking about uh, social media and uh, transparency. I think a lot of uh, parents uh, will want to watch that as well. That's at 3.30. And then later this afternoon at uh, 4.35, I think it is, uh, there's a speed networking um, opportunity uh, for participants. Um, one of the great strengths of Iowa ideas is uh, networking and building networks. And uh, there's an event tonight just for that at, at uh, 4.35. Um, so thank you all for being uh, with us today. Um, and thank you for our panelists, and especially thank you to our sponsors for making this all possible. Thank you. Um, I will see you next year. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Craig. Happy birthday. <laughs>